Hello. Welcome to True Hoop with me, Gerard Hector and Coach David Thorpe. How are you, sir? I'm well. I'm looking forward to Game 7, of course. Uh, absolutely. Um, we are recording this on Memorial Day. Uh, that is the dedication we have to you folks out there that on holidays we are in here recording content for you. David, a week ago, you and I were sitting on this very show, and both conference final series were sitting at 3-0, and we were like, ah, you know, we're getting ready to figure out this will be a week straight of Heat Nuggets previews. We were getting ready for all that. Well, the Nuggets completed their end of the bargain and won their game that night and uh, our advanced NBA finals. I've been waiting since last Monday to figure out who their opponent is. And inexplicably, the Boston Celtics down love three have won three straight games to force a game seven tonight in Boston with a trip to the NBA finals on the line. And that game six, David was out of control. There were so many things going on. Uh, those of you know, like David texts us all about games, and it's always great to get David's perspective on things because he is a coach first. That's how you watch the game. And words like terrible play, awful coaching. Like it's just <laughs> and David does find a way to devoid himself of emotion, right? Because he's not a fan first. He's a coach first. Of course, he's a fan of the sport and the game, but he looks at it through that lens first. So he takes away all the emotions of the ref screwed us and all these crazy things. It's like everybody was terrible in that, in that game and everybody has a part to play in, in where we got. And so I want to I want to start uh, sort of there at the top, David. Um, you texted that there is a rule you have that officials should all follow. And I think it is the best rule I've ever heard. Can you please tell everybody what the officials number one rule is? Call what you see. Correct. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to revisit. This this that's this game, but let's just finish this thought. I've refed a thousand, at least a thousand games in my life because as a young coach, you're working camps and mm -hmm. forget about all the practices I've refed mm -hmm. where you're calling fouls sometimes. Um, you you just call what you see, sell your call, and if you don't see it, don't call it. And um, I I just I had a, I had I talked to my I, one of my two brothers. They're both very smart guys. They they love basketball. One of my brothers said to me last night. Yesterday, he said, um, maybe we should go to four referees now. And I, I think he's smart. And first of all, he's a very smart guy. His point is, and he's a troop subscriber, and brother Mike, uh, it's a big freaking court. Yes. And we got stuff going on that they never used to have. We had two, then went to three. But this game has evolved a lot since we've gone to three. So they miss a lot. And um, like, for example, the, uh, the Jimmy Butler uh, double dribble. Mm-hmm. In the corner, nobody had a good angle to see it. You should not call that if you don't see it. It's it's a mistake. But um, they're not seeing a lot. They're unsure of a lot. And uh, uh, but I also think the players did a absolutely terrible job of making it easy for some of these foul calls. They just fouled needlessly so many times. Well, that that brings me to <laughs> so uh, there, that game happens and the the. Uh... The Heat hit three free throws, uh, Jimmy Butler does, and they go up one. And when that happens, I have Coach Thorpe, as I often do, in my ear, on my shoulder. And I'm like, I know what he's saying right now. Do not fucking foul. <laughs> like, yeah. Rule number yeah. one, don't, don't foul. H Horford should have followed that rule. He almost was the GOAT. <laughs> and I'm and the bad GOAT, not the, the good bad GOAT. goat. And I, I tweeted it out. I said, Coach Thorpe, in my ear right now, don't fucking foul. Yeah. Well, no one fouled. That was good. However... <laughs> When you play defense, the defensive possession is not over until you secure the rebound. And, David, we can get to this point now. Yeah. I assume it was Eric Spolster's strategy to have Tatum doubled so he would not get the ball at all and have no chance of touching it. And understandable. Like, you want to stop it. Please, if, if anyone's going to beat me, it can't be the best player on the court. It's got to be somebody else. Okay, fine. I get that. But no one on Miami, David, once the shot was up, figured out all right the ball is up what if it doesn't go in someone's we got to get to the glass no, not a miami heat player crashed the glass there so was that a bad decision by spo to say double tatum or was that no players you executed bad once that ball was up and you saw that your job was to secure that rebound by any means necessary uh well first of all we're dealing with human beings um let's look at let's look at big picture Derek white tipped the ball in with one tenth of a second left on Correct. right would you agree one tenth you are tense, yeah. The ball could not have rebounded more perfectly, literally perfectly for Derek White. That's a very rare thing, the way it rebounded. If it hangs on the rim a little bit longer, game's over. 
Now, Jason Tatum might have had a tip in too uh, if the ball had bounced a different way. But you're still talking, and, but maybe there wouldn't have been enough time. Like it's, if that's how close it was. He didn't double team Tatum. He denied, he had one guy denying Tatum at the point of attack. Right. He had Struess leave the ball, who was the inbounder, and then get in the passing lane, right? right? On the perimeter. To sort of front him, right? So that he couldn't get it from that. Not front him, just so one guy was denying, one guy was just in the passing line between inbounder and Tatum, which took him out of, uh, of the way of anything Derek White could have been doing. For example, if the spacing, the Celtics, all, the Celtics play, that wasn't a great play because the spacing was bad. As, right. There should have been an ability to get the ball to Mark Smart. Derek White was wide open cutting, except that there was another dude there. Which, which meant Bam at a bio could both guard two guys at the same time, White being one of them. They tried to pass to White. Uh, Bam would have stolen the ball, and the series would be over, and we'd have Denver, Miami on Thursday. Uh, so I don't think that was a problem. I actually think that was smart. Don't let Tatum beat you. What you said is right. Uh, but there is a risk when you, when you do what you did to having Derek White either cut, which he was open, until at a bio helped, or potentially tip in. Uh, they needed to race their... Tatum was there as well because they were so extended on him. I give great credit to the Celtics guys for just making – I mean, we talk about making plays all the time. Derek White made a play. Jason Tatum made a play too. It just didn't come to him. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we tell players, I don't ever look at how many rebounds you got. We have to grade you on the effort. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ball doesn't go near you, you know? Mm -hmm. But let's, let's look at some big picture stuff. Do you remember what I texted? So I didn't watch the game live. I made a choice. My wife had – I just put her on a plane to go to Scotland. I have uh, life, some lifelong friends, uh, two of them who are married, had their 35th wedding anniversary. I met my best friend in seventh grade and his stepsister, who I, we've known them forever. And we all went out for dinner. And I'm like, I, I'm just going to watch the game on Synergy. But I followed it on my phone at the end. I'm like, oh, man, Celtics are up 10 in the fourth quarter. Yep. And then I'm waiting for my Uber ride because I, I had a drink and a, a glass of wine. I'm like, yeah, I didn't want to drive. So I Ubered home. And I'm, I'm waiting for the Uber, and I see the, uh, the heat, heater down two. Jimmy Butler's on the free throw line. He makes his three. I'm like, oh, boy, 2.4 seconds. And then in three seconds, I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, How did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, which is, a, which is an, a, an issue. I don't even know why they still did it. I'm, I'm going to ask you about it in a minute. Yep. But the fun thing was I'm watching – I'm following on ESPN's GameCast. Mm -hmm. Marcus Smart misses the shot, and the clock shows 0.0, .0 <laughs> on the game. But it doesn't say final on the game cast. But in my mind, I'm thinking it's over. Miami's going sweet. I was, right. I would, I didn't carry the way I'm in the Uber. The little guy's talking to me, but eight, nine minutes, maybe 10 minutes into the ride. I have 15 minutes. I have 15 minute total ride. I'm like, you know, it didn't say final. I <laughs> probably no one, and no one is texting me. It's 11 o'clock right. at night, whatever I check. And I'm like, Oh my God, Derek White tipped it in. <laughs> so then, so I'm, I tell you that for a reason. Uh, yesterday, I, I decided I did not want to do the synergy experience. I wanted to watch the game. Mm -hmm. NBA TV replays them. Mm -hmm. I watched the replay over the course of like four hours because they replayed it twice in a row. And do you remember the first thing I texted you after I watched the game? Uh, let me say, I think it was horrible things. I'm pulling up your text right now. <laughs> I hate all this broadcaster stuff. I'm rewatching the game now. And before the game, SVG said for Miami to win, they have to have a playoff Jimmy performance. He was fired from 21 from the field. His plus minus was zero, and he lost in a tenth of a second. <laughs> right. But what, what I right after, I went, wasn't done in the game yet. What was next? Well, let's see. What was next? Uh, now then you talk about Reggie talking about zone responsibilities when you're right. boxing out. This what is else? madness. This is dumb. When the, ga when the game ended, <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible game. Yes. It was yes. a terrible, terrible game. I don't right. mean from a dramatic standpoint, suspense, right. whatever. I already knew the ending. Yes. So all that emotion's washed out, which I prefer anyway. It was a very <laughs> poorly played game. Uh, the Heat could not make a shot could not. Uh, uh, in, inside the paint. They shot great from three. The Celtics shot freaking horribly from three. It was a, a foul. One team shot 34 free throws. The other team shot 29. This was a poorly played game by probably very exhausted players. Whatever the excuse is, it was a bad game to watch uh, from, from an execution perspective. And um, not a surprise that, you know, a play like a – first of all, the Celtics are very deep. Yes. And, uh, you know, Brogdon started this series very good. Mm -hmm. 19 points in the first game, then 13, I think. It's, it's been trending down because of his injury. And then, right. of course, and he sits out. a game. And I don't know what's going to happen tonight. Do you know? 
I don't think he's, I don't think he's playing tonight. Really? I don't think so. Interesting. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, ironically, everyone thought uh, he was the better matchup with Jimmy Butler. Right. And yet he doesn't play at all. Jimmy Butler was terrible, which makes me think Jimmy's at a gas. Got to be. And, and um, if, he, if he is, that's a major problem. David, the Heat had 15 more shot attempts yeah. than the Celtics. And they were plus 21 from three. If I just told you those two things, you yeah, out, you, the Heat won. And they only had, I think, five turnovers. Right. The Heat won, right? Yeah. If I told you that without lowering you, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, that's, so it's imp- – so I, I say all that to say – to come back from 03, a lot of improbable things have to happen together. Yeah. Because it's just, in any other game, if those two things are true, you are probably, winning that game 99 out of 100. Probably the case, right. And, and, and we talked about this on Thursday. If ever there was going to be a comeback, it's probably going to be the what best net margin team in the league well, versus yeah. an eight seed. Like the, the, the probability, of if, if it wasn't likely they would do it and right. we get to the game six. But if it was going to be done ever, it's going to be this scenario and not the other way around. Miami's down 0-3. Right. They're not coming back. Correct. Right. This is, is exactly the scenario. And this is where we bring up the regular season and why it matters. As David said, they, there's a reason the Celtics were the number one adjusted net rating team and the Heat were 20th, right? Like, the, ultimately, you are who you are, right? And so the Celtics, and we said this before, you said, even though you were like, and I was wrong, you said this about yourself, you said it's much more likely that the Heat, I'm sorry, the Celtics win in four or five than the other yeah. way around. Right. But it was also more likely that if anyone was down 03, it would be the Celtics to come back and not the Heat because right. they have more ways to win, more versatile. They, they're, just, they're better. They're, and they're yeah. right this season and everything has shown right. you them. Um, and yeah, so you now, can be, look at it this way. So, so over the course of a season, one team can be better than the other. In the course of a series, it can flip. Mm-hmm. And we saw that in the first three games Miami, even in game six, obviously, Miami shot great. Boston was not playing well. Jalen Brown had some terrible games. People think it was his hand. Uh, the Celtics are the better team. That doesn't mean they'll win game seven, by the way. Correct. There's, there's one game. And anyone that tells you they know who's going to win oh, is just no. talking tough. Yes, no one knows. I, is, well, if they do, they're way smarter than me because I don't know who's going to win. This is what makes sports great, though, David, right? This is what makes it the best reality show going. Like, all the other reality shows that people watch, those are scripted to some extent. This, we have no idea what's going to happen tonight. If I were to tell you, again, after 3-0, right, anybody right. was saying the Celtics are going to win four straight, nobody would believe. They'd be like, what? That's not right. going to happen. No way. Right. Uh, I want to go into the last two-minute report about the Jimmy Butler play. No, hold on. Yeah. I, I'm going to let you do that, but we have to say this. Mm-hmm. I, I'm no Celtics fan or a Red Sox fan. Correct. Um, it, Boston, if Boston wins this game. Oh, dear God. The, those fans, they think because of their area code, or the geography, it's something in the water, or the blood, or the bagels, They're or whatever. They're already insufferable, David. They're going to become like, even more so. Well, all fans are insufferable, pretty <laughs> much. But, but uh, the idea that anything to do with Boston or their fandom is, yeah, it makes me root for them less. I mean, I like them just fine. I did not root against them. I did not root against them, and I picked them to win the series. But um, it's not the fans. Oh, you, you, you! I, I can see the headlines already. The city of the comeback kings. I can, I can see it now. Look, it, it's coming. If Boston wins this game tonight, we all know what's going to happen. And for all of all the New York fans who hate Boston fans, get ready. You're going to have to deal with this for quite some time. So, listen, it is what it is. But the last two minute report. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is what it said about about Butler, and it said yeah. Butler, it said Butler didn't double dribble. With the explanation being, Butler fumbles the ball out of his control when he ends his dribble then recovers it and legally attempts a field goal. That is what they said about the... the Did he not dribble again? Yeah, he didn't. He, he gathers it and then shoots the... Oh, throw. so it wouldn't be double dribble. It could have been a travel. Correct. They could have called it a travel. Correct. Yeah, I'm not buying it. So, but this goes back to your point. I have to watch it. referees calling what they see. Yeah. A, a lot of times, David, and we know we see this, and it, it you know, when Henry's big thing is, look, th- we have a situation with rules and officials right now where maybe the rules that govern the game the players don't respect them and yeah. the way that henry talks about it is that well the players manipulate that to their advantage right someone someone brushes up against them they act like they got shot by a cannon and they're on the ground and the referee doesn't see the push all they see is the person on the ground well someone must have fouled them and they call it back to your point that's but the you, mistake you did not see them get fouled but you're going to call it because he's on the ground that's the mistake. how do you know or Someone goes up for a layup and someone's chasing them. You assume and anticipate contact, but did you see it? 
or are you just calling it because you think that's what's going to happen? That's the first thing you learn as a referee is don't anticipate. You got to see it. I mean, as, as someone who did all those games, I, I definitely realized I got way better as a coach when I refed because I stopped yelling at the referees for stupid stuff because I knew what they were, was going through their mind. I mean, if I'm a yell at them, which I stopped doing too after after years, it's going to be because they don't understand the rules, <laughs> or they or they or they saw something right there, right? And to, you know, guys. You can see the. I mean, I had players with gashes <laughs> on their arms. When I was coaching the '80s, a lot of players grew their fingernails out. Yo, just a some, fact. some still do. And I don't think for that reason. It just it was kind of a thing. Not really long, long enough to. I mean, I have plenty of blood. And when there's no foul, and the guys, you can see the scrape. They're like, come on, he's bleeding, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a miss. No, so and I think your, your brother Mike's point's correct. It may be time to get that fourth official. I yeah. think if we do that, we have to widen the court a bit because the court's all like these guys are huge and fast yeah. and like yeah, that's a good point. We gotta start, and I know the the owners are gonna be like, "Well, we need to sell those million dollar seats in the front row." We can figure it out. Figure it out. You guys can. There's a ton of room in these big ass arenas. Figure it out. Um, but yeah, I think that is an issue. And so when players exaggerate the rules, flaunt them, whatever. This is the situation we have. And then we also have, you know, conspiracy theories. And like now I don't even know who's officiating tonight's game, but everyone's going to be mad. If it's Scott Foster or if it's, you know, whomever, it's like, oh, my God, this guy's got it in for us. We've never won a game when this official, when this referee uh, officiates our games. This undercurrent can't be good for the league and the product, right? We can't have people openly and outwardly questioning the, 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 the sanctity of the game in terms of following the rules, right? Stan Van Gundy said on the on the on the broadcast, "Oh, Eric Spolster's been yelling for Jason Tatum to get that palming call, which he does all the time. Oh, they called it once. Don't worry, Jason, they won't call it ever again. Well, that's bad. If it's a palming violation once, then it's always a palming violation, right? If it's a foul when Caleb Martin extends his elbow driving towards the rim, it's a foul when Jason Tatum extends his elbow driving towards the rim. But we know that's not what actually happens, right? That is the concerning part. Is that is the uh, it's uh, the it's we." we we were talking about succession, which I won't spoil anything, uh, but it's not a spoiler to say that uh, people at that level of wealth, the rules won't apply to them. Well, we have the same thing in the NBA is the rules barely apply to the best players. And we, that needs to be changed. Yeah. It needs to be the rookie who gets hit needs to go to the free throw line just as often as LeBron James and vice versa and everything. The, the rules are the rules. Uh, the justice should be blind. Instead, the referees sometimes are blind, as they love to say. Um, that, to me, is an issue. It's something yes. that should be addressed in the offseason, that we've got to stop rewarding. The Part of the problem is the reason why they're superstars is because they're amazing, and they think really fast, and they're experienced. So they know, they already know what you're going to do when they fake and draw the contact. Like, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We also teach that. Mm -hmm. And um, none, nevertheless, we have, we have to get better at policing the game so that everyone is treated the same. Uh, therefore, the game has more integrity. And, you know, for fans out there, I know it seems like, oh, my God, this one call screwed us. Like, and I know that's how it feels in the moment, but that's not what happens. Like, the game is a culmination of 9 billion events. All of those things in together, right, are interdependent. They cause the final outcome, right? Duncan Robinson hits one of those two wide-open threes, this situation doesn't happen. Jimmy Butler makes three more shots. You're not, there's so many things that lead to why you win and lose games. It's never, yes, I can get how it feels in the moment. Oh my God, it was an obvious out. Yes, I get it. But that isn't why. There are multiple things that happen that go on throughout the game. It's not each single thing independent of everything else. That's just not how basketball works. Miami was, was competing for a record uh, in terms of futility finishing at the rim. I don't remember if, I don't think they got the record, but it was close. Yeah, they were and um, I, cause I listened in the broadcast, they made a couple of comments about it. I read some things about it too. Um, it wasn't, I mean, Boston played good defense and they're taller, but Miami still missed those shots. More importantly, they made a huge mistake. They just continued to drive recklessly into the teeth of the defense. That was, a, if they do that tonight, I think they'll get mur murdered. Do you think that uh, that is just sort of tiredness, right? I do. I think fatigue can be a factor. Yeah. Uh, lack of confidence in your pull-up game is a factor. Bam, if I remember right, starts the game making like an 18-footer. Was very hesitant the rest of the game to do it. Uh, the I, you know There are coaches, I can't accuse Miami of this because I don't know, but I've had players tell me this season, their coaches just scream at them, go to the rim, go to the rim, go to the rim. 
and the rim is clogged and there's seven footers there and there's two taking charges and the players don't feel comfortable. Like, why are they telling me to keep driving? There's no angle there mm-hmm. to hope for a foul. That's bad basketball. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think Spo was doing that necessarily. I do think Jimmy Butler lost his confidence. Bam lost his confidence. And, and uh, thank goodness for them, for uh, Caleb Martin and Gabe Vincent. Uh, Those guys are the best players on the court for them. I think I might argue that Caleb Brown and Gabe Vincent have been the best players over the last three games for yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. all uh, losses, all, all losses, but you know, yeah. they, they played That's well. the problem. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Very did. well. Very Jimmy, well. Jimmy, J- I mean, so Jimmy and Bam after the game said in co- more colorful language, we need to make shots. You think it's in, in many ways, is that simple? If they make more shots, they, if, well, we know if they made more shots on Saturday, they would have won the game. Well, I, I don't know their mindset. I only It looked like their heads into me. What I've always taught is, uh, I didn't always teach this. As I got to be a better coach, I started teaching it. Uh, I think uh, shooting is a lot about confidence. And I think confidence comes from genuine work and turning it to genuine results. And it doesn't have to be with shooting. So I've always challenged players to really take pride in your screen setting. Cut with purpose. Finish explosively at the rim. Don't foul guys make the extra pass, all these kinds of things lead to better possessions. And when your team is playing better and you're impacting winning, even if you're not shooting slash scoring or even get the free throw line, you just feel better about yourself. Feeling better is a way to generate confidence. Correct. It's, it's, it, the alternative is also true. When you don't feel like you're helping your team, when you're getting scorched on defense, you're, you've got two illegal screens that you cut, whatever, I think it tends to drag your shooting down unless you're a psychopath. <laughs> right or jordan crawford or something right <laughs> who is i just i love him he's a pure score always unconscious right jordan clarkson um so uh i think that they have to realize the celtics are really trying to protect the rim let's take the second box shots let's put mm-hmm. stop and pop from 12 feet on the side off the board jimmy's been good at that and and uh if they start contesting us more we'll start attacking more uh, uh, that would be a smart adjustment for them. I noticed that in the game. I was like, the rim is, I'm like, the second box is open. Like, take those shots. Yeah, they just were, were so hesitant. They really which, were. Which leads me to believe maybe you don't work on second box scoring enough. Mm-hmm. They've done it before. It's, it tends to be, like I said, so it's a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope confidence. A player can miss one shot and be fine. A player can miss one shot and be wrecked. Same player. Feel is, is an issue. How you're doing the other parts of your game can be an issue. Uh, I think, I do think these guys are mentally tired. Both teams, for sure. they're tired. Yeah. Sure. Which is not good for them for the finals, but well, we'll deal with that. Yeah. We'll deal with that in a minute. I know Denver right now is like, yes. You guys well, beat the hell out of each other. Yeah. I think they would have enjoyed Miami to win game six, though. Probably because then they want Miami they, and they have home court advantage versus having Correct. to fly to Boston. Right. They would have, they would have Miami. Having you know four or five days off, but at least they'd become the Denver first. Denver may have to go to Boston, uh, and that's not a great matchup for the Nuggets. I've not done a lot of research yet, okay. but my memory is that that uh, Boston's done well with Jokic, understandably so. And Miami has not. They, they, they have bodies to throw at Jokic, yeah. which which helps number yeah. one. And yeah. Boston's just so long, and they've got a lot of tall, rangy dudes, and like, they play two bigs a lot. Whereas Denver doesn't want to play any big except for Jokic. Yeah. Um, so uh, Miami's just got out of bio, yeah. right? They yeah. really have Kevin Love maybe a little bit, but whatever, we, we'll get to that. We got to get to game seven first. Um, so am, am I wrong in thinking game seven for Boston is if White, Smart, Horford, and Brown are making shots? Because this is what we talk about, the, this Boston just being better. I just listed four dudes, and I didn't, and I didn't mention Jason Tatum, right? Because like, I feel like Tatum's going to be himself, I think, more or less. Those guys are hit. Like, I don't. Miami doesn't have enough to counterbalance that, right? We talked about this all year. Miami struggles to score points, and we're like, well, if Jimmy and Bam aren't hitting, like, okay, what if Jimmy and Bam hit tonight, but Gabe and Max and everybody else don't hit tonight, which is certainly possible. Now what? I just feel like Boston have, has more options. Right. Well, you're right. Have you? Did, are you a, not a Marvel Avengers movie guy? I mean, I know them. I don't. I okay. don't. I haven't watched them like. You, know. you don't really, so you don't know the Doctor Strange when Iron Man saw him in no. space. Okay, you don't know about that. What about um, the Men in Black series? Yeah, yeah. So the third one, which was a really, I, the second one, yeah, I went I very good. I thought the third one was really good. Uh, the actor who also was in Boardwalk Empire, he's, he's, uh, 
He's the the Jewish uh, gangster. I forget oh, his yeah, name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rothstein, maybe. Yeah, really yeah. good. Mm-hmm. He plays a space dude, and he he's thinking of he knows all the different scenarios how things can play out in mul- multiple futures, right? And that's exactly what we have here. There are so many different ways for Miami to win. Many of them include their stars playing well. Many of them include their role players playing great. To your point, let's say Jimmy sucks and Bam sucks as scorers. Boston goes seven for 35 again from three or whatever they did the last game. And Duncan Robinson goes crazy. Eh, They can win that game, right? There's a lot of scenarios. If you're looking at probability, that's different. So now you, st- you stack up all the likely scenarios for tonight. Boston has more scenarios in their favor than Miami. Yeah. But as we just saw, there was a scenario in the last game that said uh, Boston's going to shoot terribly, uh, not do great on, on, the, on the backboards. Although, remember, Miami got 70 off his rebounds apart because they missed 60 shots. Correct. Let, me, let me say that again. 60. Yes. Thank not you. including the second oh. free throws. Mm. 33 of 93. You're going to get... You're not going to get, you know, all but five rebounds. But the other team misses 60. They got 17. So, um, but there was a scenario somewhere that, uh, that allowed for Derek White to get a tip in because he's not a stiff. They've got good players, a lot of good players. And so Boston should be favored. And they have more outs, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But um, Miami's got plenty of way. If, if anyone's going to win this game after losing three straight, it's it's a it's it's a team like the Heat that is just they embrace the what what did Spolster say the other day? We're a gnarly group. We're a gnarly group. Yep. Yeah. Yep. This is they they're not shell shocked. And, and I told Henry this after Game Three because we wrote that article about Heat of a fuck you culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I said it's in the show. I don't remember. I said to Henry, he he asked about you know their you know what happens if they lose this whatever. I said Henry. The point is, they're an eight seed. They took Boston right. two straight on the road. And they took out the number one seed. Right. The exactly. Like, whatever. This is the story is the story. They can still lose the series. It's amazing that they're here. And it's still amazing that they're here. And I, 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 I mean, I'm not a betting guy anyway. Right. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I would favor Boston. Just like in four game five, you asked what would happen. I said, I think the teams are pretty even. I give Boston a slide edge in game five. Yeah. Well, I look stupid when I said the teams are even. After a couple games, but I don't look so stupid. Not after last night, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're pretty even. Yeah. Uh, Boston, by the way, for those out there, Vegas betting favorites, of course, tonight minus seven much? points. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a, it's a solid it's number. It's a big right? number. It's a, it's a solid yeah. number. Yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're pretty confident in Boston tonight. Um, okay, so David, game sevens. You know, you hear all the cliches. Yeah, strategies are out the window. Everyone knows everyone's plays. We there's nothing you're going to do that's going to surprise anybody. Are game sevens about that? And what you say when you when you coach your guys, it, particularly with the, when it's the draft process and they're getting ready, and you're like, if you think this is about basketball, you're going to lose. This is a fucking yeah, it's war, a war. Yeah, and it's a you war. have to win. The, every, right. So it's every possession, like it's the last, you have to fight. Yeah. Whatever energy you have left at this point. So is that what Game Seven's about? I mean, it's, it's all of it. It helps to make shots. Being locked in matters. Normally teams aren't shooting great in close Game 7s. Um, there is no real advantage to this game on that front, Gerard, because these are two veteran teams. I, I don't, I, you know, I say this all the time, as you know, there's no such thing as rookie mistakes, just mistakes. Mm-hmm. Al Horford made two of the dumbest mistakes. He fouled Jimmy Butler in the end one. Mm-hmm. He was just overwhelmed and fouled him so stupidly. And they fouled him for three to lose the series. Yeah. Let's face it. Mm-hmm. One more bounce on the rim or just a brick by Marcus Smart. Right. Because it wasn't a great shot. It was a right. chuck. Mm-hmm. Horford, the, Horford screwed up. He gave, he gave Butler uh, 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 six points on two plays mm-hmm. with fouls, and he's brilliant. Uh, but when it comes – so I don't think that matters. I do think the urgency helps the veteran, and both teams have, are loaded with – you know, they're playing veterans. Mm-hmm. They, they're men. Right? The, we always say youth is wasted on the young for a reason. Yes. Because they're not mindful of anything. I, we had dinner last night with my, my niece who just graduated at Boston College, very smart young lady. She's taking a year off. She's working for a year before she goes to law school. And uh, she even knows she's brighter than most. But, uh, like, they're just they're 22. Like, the world is their oyster. Like, whatever, you know? The, the men are more mindful, typically. Men and women who are older are more mindful of the moment. I think both these teams are very aware that you just – and the last game ended 
in a perfect way of there is no every millis every tenth of a second counts. The margin of error could be razor, razor thin again. Here we are, game seven after game six, literally was decided with one tenth of a second left. These are even teams. The Miami Heat snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. That's what happened in that last tenth of a second. They snatched victory <laughs> and then gave it back because they were down ten with four to play. Right. Right. And, and so, and let's uh, let's remember this. And you can look it up and tell me if I'm wrong. I remember looking this up before long ago. Spurs lose on the Ray Allen three. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your memory of Game Seven? I have I have a couple memories of Game Seven. I so feel, a time ago. I feel like shell shocked Spurs game seven, if I'm if I remember correctly. Okay. So trailing ninety to eighty eight. Hmm. Kawhi Leonard missed a three with a minute, maybe a minute forty to play, I don't remember, but something less than two minutes. A three to take the lead. Mm. With less than a minute, I think, Tim Duncan misses a shot and a tip in. Mm. And then what I remember remember the most, because we had been writing about it, I was at ESPN then. Uh, early in the series, the Spurs just dared LeBron to shoot, and he wouldn't shoot. But as the series went on, just like we're talking with Miami, he started saying, you know what, I can't get to the rim. And this was super powerful LeBron. Mm-hmm. This is not the guy we see now. This is nobody can guard him. Mm-hmm. And, but with three or four people, they can. So he started making jumpers. So at 90-88, with like 40-some-odd seconds to go, he nailed uh, like a not such a short jumper to go up four. Mm-hmm. And then I think the Spurs turned it over, and the Heat won. I think LeBron made free throws, and he won. Obviously, 195-88, I think. Um, yeah, the Spurs didn't score again after they got to 88, I don't think. But my point is, they were right there. So here we go. Uh, uh, Miami has to be absolutely taking strength from the fact that what's happened for six games is over. It only matters if you let it matter. Yeah, We yeah. can beat these guys. We've done it before. We can beat these guys. It's going to be a war. Let's fight every possession. I was just going to go there. So this idea about momentum and stuff carrying over, it only does if you let it, right? Because after yeah. going up, after going on 3-0, the Heat had a little momentum, right? Yet right. they lost three straight. So what, what happened then? So when anything is possible in this game four and is literally about what kind of mindset you come in with. Are you shell-shocked or are you like, man, frick, whatever. Like, shit happens. It's basketball. So let's just strap it up, lace it up, and play. And I think, to your point, if a team that's going to, you have to have that gnarly attitude that Spo and Jimmy and those guys have, the fuck you culture who are like, oh, you won three straight, fuck you. It takes that. Anybody else who's reading, you know, headlines on their phones and shit. And, nope. and you, and you no. know what? Uh, my experience with NBA players uh, is they tend not to have their phones on this time of year. Yeah. Love them. They, they, or their social media, I should say. They, uh, and they're always advised of that by their agents, by their families, and by their veteran players. If you have to text, since we get all that, but um, don't don't get on Twitter, don't Locked get on in. Facebook, whatever. You just you just it's only going to distract you and yeah. wear you down. Ignore it. Lock in. All right. So these yeah. these these two teams, David, are exhausted, but they got to listen. It's a chance for the uh, a trip to the finals. The NBA championship is at stake. Um, you know, you don't like to do predictions, but. What are you, who are you leaning towards um, tonight? I mean, I see it as, uh, I think the Heat, this version of the Heat team is, you know, a 50 win team. Uh, uh, they're very good. The way Gabe's played, the way Duncan has been playing. Um, uh, Jimmy, until even, even in the last game, he almost had a triple double. He just did not, not shoot very well. well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this is a formidable team. Uh, I think Boston's the team we've seen all season. They are a, they're a little bit underachieving, um, as and they've continued to be that. They're prone to just bouts of what the hell's going on, low IQ <laughs> or just poor execution. But they're better than the Heat, and they're at home. Yeah. And uh, I would I think they have more outs. I think they have more. They have two guys that can really go nuclear. Uh, Marcus Smart was a minus 10 last game, but he played well. Mm-hmm. I thought he played well. He four, made, they only made seven threes. He made four. Mm-hmm. Now, it took 11. <laughs> so that's something to look at, too, yep. is um, they had 12 turnovers. I want to say they got to limit that. Mm-hmm. Um, Miami wants him to shoot. So how does he take advantage of that w- would be a factor. But I, 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 I would favor boss, uh, Boston. I mean, everyone will favor yep. Boston. And seven, I, I think that's a little high. Yeah. 
I'm not a betting man, but I I, I think this this it's game could easily it could easily come down to the last couple of possessions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same. I to that point, the probability and the ways in which they can win there are more for the Celtics. So because of that, I'm going to lean towards them slightly, not overwhelmingly, not like. Again, it wouldn't surprise me if any possible outcome happens t- t- tonight. Nothing would surprise me. But yeah, I, I, I want to. Okay, okay, finish the I, talk. I was going to say, please. but because they have more optionality, I'm yeah. going to lean towards them. I, I, one thing I'm looking for early is uh, I was, I mean, it, it sounds a little silly because I don't know him, but I was really proud of Duncan Robinson mm-hmm. for taking those threes. Yeah, yeah. He should have taken those threes. Of course, wide open. I, I, right, and he's been shooting great. Um, I don't think anyone on earth has thought about any one subject more than Duncan Robinson has been thinking about those two open threes. <laughs> is my that's my guess. The guy's paid to make shots. Yep. He missed them. He's made a bunch in this series as well as in his career. Um, I hope he comes out chucking it, man. Just yeah, fuck it. Let's go. Firing. And I would think that culture would say, "We're beating your ass if you don't shoot." Yeah. Yeah. Like we're going, we're riding with you, my guy. We're riding with you. Make or miss, you're shooting them. Yeah, you're let. Yeah, we'll do our job. You do yours. That's your job. If he does that, um, you know, there's a seven, eight, three game in him because he's hard to stop. He's hard. He's just tall, and you know they're they're trying to extinguish Jimmy. Don't give him a chance to breathe. We, you know, Kyle Lowry's uh, really kind of sunk. Yeah. yeah, and that's a factor too. He was bad, mm-hmm. and he's been good in some other games. Bad. You know, Gabe Vincent's really kind of taken that spot. It's what you talk about the older players, right? It's yeah, they can't that maintain flickers. the level. Flickers, right? It's flickers. Um, yeah. For the first time in this series, David, the team that shot better from three lost the game. Yeah, first time in this series, it's always been whoever shot well from three was winning the game. I and mean, the typically that has been yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. Just, this is a it, uh, it's, this is a fun series. I'm excited. Like I, I think I think you're right. Duncan's just gonna keep firing him because I hope I hope he does. I hope he does. Make or miss. This is this is your job is to do that. That's what we empower you to do. Keep yeah. doing that. We'll figure the other shit out. Yeah, yeah. We have to see Miami. I don't care how Boston starts. If Miami is is uh, pressing early, struggling to, to take the shots they're supposed to take, that would be a bad sign. Whether Boston scores or not, if they're just doing their thing, and and I'm sure Spolstra is trying to say. Look what happened last game. We're down 10. And we, if the game is one more bounce on the rim and we win and we're going moving forward, we, we can be down 10 in this game too. Like, don't think for one second we can't come down 10. Right. They, they lead the playoffs, I believe, in, in victories. And they have three victories trailing by 10 or more in the playoffs. Yeah. And as Swo said about this team, they do everything the hard way. So, again, this, this sort every, of – Every team does everything right. the hard way. I know he said that. <laughs> you know, so every like- team, nothing's easy. <laughs> So it's like, listen, they're, again, they're, I don't think they're going to be phased by it. Um, I, what I'm watching for is, to your point, if they're not making shots, Miami, but are they still hanging around? At halftime, is it three points, five points, six points? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I feel good. But if it's that thing where they're not making shots and Boston's making, and then it's 9, 12, 15. And I'm yeah, like, it, you're, say, you're saying you if Miami tries to pull a Phoenix the last couple of close that games they've had, correct. they're in trouble. Correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> yeah, then they're in trouble. Yeah, Spoh's not gonna get fired, but yeah, they're in trouble. Yeah, I think I I don't I don't, I, don't, I don't expect that. I don't Probably because I think Boston's tired too. Yeah. Um. One thing I want to say about Boston's defense. Have you noticed this, Coach? They are not biting on Jimmy's pump fakes anymore. It must have been like a drilled into their head. Should've Do been. not bite on that at all. They're not. They're Should've not falling for it at all now. Yeah. Right? They're using your phrase. They're walling up and tolling up. He comes into yeah. the lane, does that. Everyone just gets up right, gets their hands up, and no one's jumping off the ground. That's what they should be doing. Create that separation, and that, that little thing matters, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Smart. Well, good, good good, job there by the, uh, by the Celtics defense. And Robert Williams, I want to give him the shout-out, the third. Like, he's, he's played some really good defense in this series, and he is that X factor for them. We talked about this last year with them going to the finals, right, because he had gotten hurt. And we're like, man, if that guy's hurt, it's a problem because he's such a game changer for what they do defensively. And it, the way he can rotate and cover ground, I'm like, man, this guy is outstanding. Uh, the other guy is um, Derek White. I mean, so there was a There was a play. Jimmy Butler's driving with, to his right, um, uh, maybe third quarter. And um, a light-skinned guy blocked his shot. I had just looked away from the TV. I put it back on. And um, I'm like, man, that fucking Jason Tatum. <laughs> he, he's a better defender than you realize. And then just 
just as the uh, ball is being taken out of bounds, and I realize it's not live, the game's over, I'm in no rush here, and I just thought, I don't know if that was Tatum or not, actually. <laughs> so I rewound it. It was freaking Derek White. That's yeah, I was in my office TVs, and uh, I'm like, that because he's so good at the rim. He's the best guard defender pretty much at the rim. He is. Um, and, uh, yeah, his, his, his value is, especially with Brogdon being out, can't be understated. His defense is outstanding that length, and David, and he's shooting it well from three. I mean, so he's hitting threes. That's just – yeah, you know, you're not only is he taking away possessions from you on off on when you're on offense, and he's then converting it on the other end into three points. If you, That's, you know, this is just my opinion, but uh, I thought the team that had the most potential to be the best team this season was the Clippers. Yeah, you did with Paul and, and mm-hmm. Kawhi. Okay, that didn't happen mostly because of injury. I picked Milwaukee to win the championship or win the East rather. I don't remember who I, I don't think I picked a champion before the season because uh, Missoula is a rookie coach. Mm-hmm. And I thought Milwaukee has the sameness to him. Turned out wasn't right. So then you go to Boston on paper. This is the best team, mm-hmm. right? This is the best team. And uh, I, I actually like Joe Missoula. I, I, I said this when they're down on three, uh, I wouldn't fire him. Yeah, you He'll never be worse as a coach than his first year. Right. And, yeah. you know, you can not only do you get better from year to year if you do all the right things, you get the humility. Better in the series. Not, yes, you can get better as the series goes on. Ty, Ty Lue learned for sure. Reference points happen. Oh, this yeah. shit's been kind of weird the last two games. I mean, what if I try this? Like, I mean, like, especially we talk about all the time. If you're pragmatic that's and humble, yeah. you're, you're going to be do just fine as a coach. Um, all right. Let's take a quick break, David. And when we come back, we will talk about the Denver Nuggets. All right, so it has been, God, they haven't played a game since Monday, last Monday. So we're already on seven days and not going to play till Thursday. So it's going to be a nice 10 day break for them. Um, first, right off the bat, bad or good being off that long? Well, compared to what? Being off one day, two day, <laughs> right, 20, 30. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be fine. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's going to be fine. Good. I think it's a better, a better off. Uh, I mean, you just get sore. That's what people don't realize is forget about the injuries. Mm -hmm. The soreness is a factor Mm -hmm. because soreness leads to injury Mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those bangs and bruises and bumps have healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even though they don't play a bench, they have a good bench. They they could have some very spirited games. I I hope Michael Malone uses that bench in this finals because he's going to need it. Well, I don't think he will, but he's using them in practice, I'm sure. I haven't asked, but I'm sure that they're playing some spirited five on five, maybe over the weekend, probably. And I so in those moments, I wonder if he, cause you're watching as a coach, does he see something from those games? Like, wait a minute, these guys are, I can play no. these guys. No. no, I think, no, I think he had made a decision. I, wa- I watched them during the season. I think he, he, there was one point he just decided I'm done. Mm-hmm. I'm going with my core group and Christian, who's a rookie mm-hmm. who didn't play in the last game. Uh, no to the new guys at Calvin Booth, got, which is why I don't think they like each other. I'm not getting any of those guys. Yeah, I'm sticking with these main core guys. That doesn't mean he'll do it in the finals, but probably will. Um, how difficult is it when you are the team that's been resting for now going on seven, eight days to prepare for two teams? That's kind of what they're doing, right? Their scouts kind of split in half. We're reviewing the Heat and we're reviewing the Celtics simultaneously. How difficult is that when you're preparing for two teams versus one? You know, because you still have two full days, but like game one's Thursday. Mm-hmm. So you still got Tuesday, Wednesday. My guess is they focus more on themselves. Okay. And then what they've done is they've looked at what they think they probably need to shore up, tighten up, feature against both teams. Mm-hmm. Some of them will be the same, some will be different. And they've added that to their practice structure okay. yep. to make sure, hey, if we play Miami, you got to really get this better. Uh, like for zone offense, for example. Mm-hmm. If we play Boston, uh, we got to get this better. Whatever it is, offensive, defensively. And so you kind of introduce both, but yeah, it's double the work, mm-hmm. but you'd rather do that than have to keep playing. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a better situation. Without question. I had this yeah. thought about when you're the team that's waiting and game seven tonight and you're gonna, your opponent's going to be one of those two teams. And I was like, these all these smart basketball minds, the players, right? Who know the game really well and their coaches. Do you have a watch party? Like, right. You're, you're in the facility. Everybody just show up. We'll eat some food, whatever. We're just going to watch the game. All right. And then we can pick up things and talk about, 
what you think? Oh, no, I think this is what they should do, right? Like, do you, what do you think? Like, does that happen in the NBA? Is that something that they should do? You know, I've never, I've never had someone tell me they did a watch party, but um, my, I think there's two things here. If, uh, if they decided, you know, I just want our guys to have their regular routines at home, mm-hmm. um, then you're not going to do it. Uh, but I also, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I really do. And um, let's just watch it together. Mm-hmm. We're not going to laugh and yell. We're, we're going to take notes. We're going to pay attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it could be instructive. I think so, right? But I, I will find out. I'll find out if they're doing I, that. It, it, it's a good it, idea. It would be a good idea just because everyone in there is a smart basketball mind, in ver- in, but different mind in varying degrees, right? You're going to be looking at it if you're a player through your matchup. Okay, that's going to be me guarding Tatum or Jimmy or whoever, or whatever the situation is. What would I do? Ooh, a good idea. Or maybe not. I wouldn't do that. Like, yeah. I think it's really instructive. I, I'll tell you, um, it's not a watch powder, but when I, when I knew my son was probably going to be a college athlete was when he was 10 years old playing all-star baseball. And we, we were, we have a small little league. I've talked about it before probably. And the starting pitcher in our semifinal game is my son's best friend, still best friend. They were, you know, 10 men, 10 or 11. And, um, and then Max came in and saved the game and he was our best he was our best overall player and it was fucking June in Florida. Hot. <laughs> yeah. We probably played at one o'clock and the other semifinal game was on another field across the concession stand. And you know, most of these little league players, none of them kept, none of them played high school sports right, right. on his team, except for these two guys who was stud basketball players, it turns out. But back then they were our best baseball players and everyone couldn't wait to go home and have popsicles, whatever the hell right. these dumbass parents gave their 10 year old kids. <laughs> Uh, I said to Max and Alex, like, what do you guys want to do? And they said, Palm Harbor is still playing. That was, that was the number one seed. We're going to go watch them. Mm. First of all, my son knew a bunch of those players because right, right. players always know each other, the good ones, right? right? right. And he's like, we're going to – and it's two of those guys, by the way, are pitching for, like, one of the best teams in the country right now in college. Mm-hmm. They were twins. And so I have a picture. I, <laughs> my wife has it, like, framed. I, I'm behind them. I got them food. Yeah. And it's just Fatucci and Thorpe, Alex Fatucci <laughs> and Thorpe. Two little dudes, Alex is tall, wearing your yellow jersey. They're scouting. Fucking, <laughs> fuck yes. They're scouting. Fuck yes. They're scouting. Exactly right. And, and I always do the same thing as coaches. Uh, when he, later on, when he started playing AU basketball, uh, uh, our head coach was a dad. He had been a coach before, but he wasn't super invested in it. Another assistant coach and I were. And uh, there was nothing else to do after you finished the game, but go. The go. That's all we ever did. And, and then scout the next game after that because we might play them in the finals, whatever. I, that's the, the only way to think about it. Players aren't always that way, but they often are. They often are. So to your point, I'd be shocked if every single Nuggets player wasn't watching game yeah, seven. I agree. Whether they're together or not, I don't know. Right. I'd be shocked. Yeah. And, and they love the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They love the game. They, 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 they're not fans. Right. Uh, uh, they're fans of plays more than, and they're fans of players, right? right? So I'm sure some guys hate Tatum. Some guys hate <laughs> Jimmy Butler, but I'm sure there's some guys that love Tatum right. and love Jimmy Butler. Right. And so they can't help. They root for him all the time. It's hard to root against him now, even though you don't want to play, but they all, I'm sure they all want to play Miami. Yeah, oh, for sure. There's no doubt. Home court advantage. Home court advantage yep. And a better matchup. A better team, no doubt. Yep. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I'd be absolutely shocked if every one of them hasn't been watching every one of these yeah. games. Almost every NBA player I've been talking to this summer is watching games every night. Got to. You, you, you love the yeah. game. If, well, if you love yeah. it, right? So, right. Um, Nicole Jokic, uh, you know, because they've been off all week. Um, he was talking about, you know, he was asked a question about being a dad now. Um, and has that changed his perspective as a player, helped him, et cetera? And he was like, no, he's like, I don't think being a dad can help you with that. Like, that's one has got nothing to do with the other. He was like, I think for me, I've always known that basketball was not the most important thing in my life. It was always going to be my family. And, this, and now that they're actually here and I have them, it just reinforced, and I'm paraphrasing, what I thought. And I was right, right? Like my family, and this is, you know, one of the things I, I admire about you that I say all the time is that nobody loves basketball more than Coach Thorpe, but nobody loves their family more than basketball than Coach Thorpe, right? Like that is your most important that's your perspective and i think a lot of players have that perspective david but they're not often all celebrated for it for whatever reason whether however they say it it doesn't come out a certain way but i think many players feel that way like yes of course this is my job and i love it but it isn't the most important thing in the world to me right like 
my family is. I, I, I'm a three-dimensional person. I have many interests and things I do outside of my work that I do and love very much, but there are other things that are important to me. So I think it's while we celebrate Jokic, we should celebrate all players for having that kind of perspective. Okay, so I'll get a little deep on this subject, and and you'll be right with me. Um, I I don't like seeing uh, Steph Curry's uh, daughter. I think it was in, in the uh, interview. <laughs> the, the podium on the, uh, on and the Tatum right, on the podium and Tatum's son. However, as a coach in the eighties mm-hmm. in America, it isn't a racial problem. It's a it's a uh, economic problem. Families with less income tend to have real problems at home with a, a single moms or single dads. Obviously, plenty of wealthy parents have that issue too. Uh, in the black community, when I, was, when I was raising my players in the 80s, none of the dads were around. It was a major problem in America. We all know why that is the problem with the terrible things our country has, has instituted from years. Literally, the, the, ju- the, the, judicial sy- the judicial system worked against mm-hmm. our black citizens um, and still does in many cases. And so... We have to consider context, mm-hmm. knowing that, and many of these, I, I don't know any of these players. I don't know if they even are close to their dads. I coach a couple of players who have never really talked to their dad. I also have some that are incredibly close to their fathers and um, they're very fortunate as, as I feel I was with mine. Um, any, to your point, like if that's what we have to do to show our fans, like, hey, young man, like this is the most important thing we'll ever do. And so uh, you don't have to be on TV with your son. I get to be on TV with my son or daughter because I'm a basketball player. Right, right. But the point is they're with me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, so I, I, and so this is me being proud of my child or my children. I think that's fantastic. And we see it in other sports too, right? Mm-hmm. I don't watch the Super Bowl typically, but I have watched some. And, I mean, the second the game's over, for the here come the wife and kids. Yep. I love that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got no problem with that. We're, we're all supposed to be – the sport is just – it's just a game. It's just a game. It's a job in a game. There should not be lives on the line. There's jobs on the line. For sure. <laughs> I, I'd like to I, – I didn't hear what Joker said, and I couldn't play it on Twitter this morning because Twitter sucks <laughs> um, these days. But absolutely – I don't know. I don't think Joker should speak for all dads. Mm-hmm. I think human beings are motivated differently and through every spectrum. And I'm sure I know this. There are some players that woke the fuck up. Like I, I, I have got to feed my family. In some cases it was too late. I've had players call me and you can hear in their voice. They have seen the light, mm. but they're playing. I've had guys play in Iraq. I've had guys play in Iran. I've had guys play in Jordan and China and all over the place. NBA level players. Yeah. Some of them actually played in the NBA. No kidding. In the NBA, guaranteed contracts. And now they had a family to feed. And they were all about the business because they want to take care of their kids. Uh, one of them, whose dad was in jail his whole life, mm. was not going to make that same mistake once he had children. The problem is he fucked up and was kicked out of the, was it, was out of the NBA before he had children. So I, I, whatever motivates you, I don't care. But yes, we should be always be uh, congratulating. It's easy for us to ignore. Well, we, we talked about succession. That guy was a fucking the worst dad of all time. <laughs> Has ever been a worse dad than that guy? Not a good dad. Not Jesus good dad. Christ. I mean, come on. Uh, so uh, to me, we're all better off as a community at, at large when, when families matter. Yeah. And so we should always congratulate and admire those that, va- that value it the way they should. And, and it's about perspective, right? Because as you said, like, it's just the game, right? Like, yes, important, but it's not like, it's not life or death. Jobs, Yes. You're bad at your job. You're probably going to get fired, right? That's how the world works. And that stinks. Right? And, that's, yeah. and that does stink for sure. But yeah. And I think for some players, you mentioned this, David, it, it gives them something else in their life, right? And it helps them balance some players, right? Because if they're too wound up about basketball, it may go, the, go a bad way for them, right? They're too locked in on the game. Something else for you that can give you perspective. Again, hey, I come home. I had a bad day. Look, I got my smiling wife or a partner or whatever. And my smiling kids. Who cares? I just went 10 for two, two for 15. It'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> and they, sh- they should think that. Put in the work, mm-hmm. but you shouldn't, you shouldn't get mentally anguished over it. It's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a game of mistakes. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a game of mistakes. But, and, we, and I was talking about this at dinner last night. As parents, we mess up a lot too. Yeah, sure. Everyone but, messes up. Um, but, but the game, you, you know, once the game's over, you can't go back. It's just the next game. Mm-hmm. 
we get a chance. You know, our, our lives are one long game, typically. <laughs> yes. Now, you can lose it during a stretch. Like, if you're a really bad dad at some point, uh, you're, I, I've got people I know really well whose fathers were really terrible and had and, and, and no problem with money. They're just bad dads. They just they didn't care, including some people that I grew up with, like dear friends of mine uh, whose parents were alcoholics or whatever. And um, they've, my friends, I mean, they're my age. They're sad. They, they didn't have a, 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 a fun family life, whatever. So these players, I mean, Steph Curry was raised mm-hmm. with an NBA household. It worked out just fine. Yeah, worked out fine. Yeah, you can be a rich, famous celebrity and still be a great father for sure. Yeah, it, it's it's about what you prioritize and what matters to you, right? And that's really it. And you, you have to give a shit and want to do it. Well, <laughs> Lou, we talked about Kareem's terrible game yeah. against the Celtics. Mm-hmm. And he said, I want my dad to come on the bus. Mm-hmm. Like, that, I love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Memorial Day Massacre. That, 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 was after, that was after that game. Think about that, was right? That, that, was that that game? I was that the it game? was. Think about that, David. You used to play finals games on Memorial Day. We're not no finals on Memorial Day now. We're like, we're not till June 1st. We got, we got a couple days post. Um, yeah. One last thing I wanted to bring up. Rich Paul, yeah. who is the uh, head of Clutch Sports, um, sent out an interesting uh, tweet series. Uh, I want to say over the weekend, yeah. And he was talking about a draft that he was looking at, and I'm going to read a couple of parts here. He's like, I'm looking over a specific draft year where 18 of the top 30 picks are out of the league before reaching a second deal. They want you guys to focus on the money. So the focus is the pick number. Focus on the details of being a professional and building great habits. This will allow you to maintain a position, and the money will come alongside of that. After you're drafted, the work starts over. You go from number one now to one of 450, and nobody cares about where you went in the draft. Young agents evaluate the character and the talent the same. It's okay to not have a guy in the lottery. Lottery is for ego, not evolution. When I say who that's for, both agent and player, it means zero in your next meeting as an agent and zero for the player against, you know, the guys they're competing against in the league who literally want to take their jobs. And I feel like that's something that you, David, as a player development coach can feel a kinship with, right? Because you're always working your guys and telling them, uh, none of that stuff matters, man. Like it is draft is one night. It is about the work. Okay, yeah. you got drafted, yippee! Yeah. But you are now number one yeah. of 450 dudes in the league. So what? Like, you got to work now. He's, he's only wrong in one sense. It does, the draft, where you get drafted does matter because you get more rope to hang yourself with when you're a lottery pick. <laughs> more rope to hang yourself. We you know, do. That part is true, yes. I mean, Kevin Knox is still in the league. Yes, you will get more opportunity if you, because, yes, right. yes. Right, you just continue to suck as long as you want. When you're, when you're a lottery pick, they won't pay you a lot of money. Right. Same statistics on a second round pick or an undrafted player, you're in Poland. Okay. But he's right from the general sense. Uh, as I told a player the other day, an uh, established NBA player, um, every one of these motherfuckers wants your money. Every one of them wants your money. And what I mean by that is I told him, he's a young player, but he's, he's a you know, he's star in the league. Uh, all of these young guys that come to your team, they want your playing time. And that means your money. And so as soon as you take your eyes off that ball, it's going to hit you right in the fucking jaw. Mm. You can, l- last summer, I felt like, based on everything I've heard and saw on social media, Scotty Barnes was having a great time in the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing hoop everywhere, living, living, the, living large as the rookie of the year. And he got smacked right in the head. He was bad to start this season. He finished much better. Uh, everyone wants your money. You better go to work. And by the way, they're trying to beat your brains in also. on the other team, too. <laughs> the guys on your team want your position. The guys on the other team want to kick your ass. Yeah, the draft, and we'll, and we'll talk more about the draft as we get closer now. Um, I'm starting to get, I'm starting to pay a little more attention now. There's some intriguing stuff going on with it. But yeah, it's just one night. Good or bad, next day, as, as one, of my, one of my players famously told uh, a, a reporter once, uh, Coach Torp still had me in the gym at 7 in the morning. The day after I got trapped in the first round. He wasn't right. It was like nine. It wasn't seven. <laughs> but what else are you going to do? Right. I knew you got drafted last night. Congratulations. So what? Kind of work. Yeah. I did. I couldn't even. He was my first ever drafted player that I was going to continue to work with. I had a couple of players drafted years prior. But um, yeah, whatever. In fact, of those two players I had drafted in the year 2000, only one made the team. The other one didn't. And they both were drafted. Lesson learned. We got work to do. That has got to be, Dave, so it, it, the NBA is such a precarious place when you are a player, particularly if you are not, you know, one of those all NBA MVP level dudes. But even those players, which is why they are all NBA MVP level dudes, the reason why they are that is because 
they work maniacally to be there. Every every year is an audition, right? We're, we're bringing in a new crew or free agents or trades or someone who comes in is going to say, oh, I want your minutes, All right? So they're going to go hard and come at you when they're playing scrimmaging and practice, whatever. It is a never-ending battle to be to hold your spot and to rise higher. That's, that's gotta be, mentally, you've got to be a different kind of person to make it in these, in these leagues. I mean, I think it's the same for your profession, my profession. To be successful, um, you, there is a component of hard work. For sure. It's not just natural talent, right? Screenwriters, editors, actors, plumbers. Like uh, when we, I told you, uh, we had a roof put on recently, a new roof. Man, every uh, worker uh, uh, worked their ass off. I mean, every night, I stepped on four nails because there were some in the bushes, but none of our cars had any problem. We left them on the streets normally, but when people end up driving them, they cleaned up everything, not a bit of trash, lots of trash during the day because mm-hmm. we had eight people on the roof, <laughs> literally. Forget about the foreman, whatever. But by five o'clock, whatever time, they, they worked till like eight o'clock. Yeah, yeah. They worked till like pretty much sunset. Man, they picked everything up. They fucking worked their ass off. I was super impressed. Super impressed with them. Um, that's how you get ahead. You got to work. Yeah, there's, there's, there's really no other way to, no other way to do it. Um, did you see that story about Eric Lewis's potential burner account? Well, I know you saw it because... I did. I didn't understand because uh, I didn't... The scrolling didn't work for me. Uh, uh, what's going on? So, and I should say this, that uh, we at True Hoop, Henry, tweeted that out. Um, he had had a source who had told him that this might be Eric Lewis's burner account. Well, I, actually, I think Henry's exact words were, I have it on good authority from a source that this is, in fact, Eric Lewis's burner account. So, I, I didn't realize. I thought Henry was retweeting it. So, so, so he, Henry broke so, it? So, no, no, Henry didn't break it. So, he, the, the source it. told him, and then the, when it was put out there, he retweeted what That's was already what I put thought. out there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, Wow. I mean, first of all, I'm not surprised by that. Like, referees are people just like we are. Like, so if you have burner accounts, of course they're going to have burner accounts it's, too. It's weird. It's just weird. And it's like, use it in the way in which when you can get found out so easily. Who, who on earth goes out there championing for referees? And like, that's just an odd, right? Cause was he, wasn't he defending himself? Right. That's just an like, odd what are thing. You to, doing? That's just an odd thing to do. Everyone's going to know, oh, that, well, that's you. Like, who? But they, even, even if they didn't know, <laughs> why, I mean, you're not going to win a Twitter argument. <laughs> right. Like, people have been trashing me forever on Twitter. Now they don't even care anymore. Twitter is so messed up. No one even reads my stuff. So anyway, the sure, NBA but... is, is investigating it to whatever that means. Um, yeah. But look, it's just, this it's ties back to not a good look. where we started. Yeah. NBA and the officials right now, Adam can't like this. You got to nip this thing in the bud and figure out some things with your officiating. We talked about adding a fourth. Why it, something's just it's just it's not good for your product. I don't like it and it's weird. Yeah, we don't want them talking about anything but the game. Yes, if we're the talking pra- about this this coaches. is not good. That's that's right. very well said, David. Right. That's not good. We right. shouldn't be talking about you guys. No one should know who right. Scott Falls or any of these people are. And the fact that we know so much about them, problematic. I'm with you. All right, guys. Game 7 tonight. By Thursday, we will know who is going to be playing the Denver Nuggets. I think we'll do some more. You'll you'll have some more study this week, so you'll have a, a good point on what you want to say about the matchups. I know you have good ideas now, but you'll know for sure for Thursday's show what you think is going to work for whomever the Nuggets play uh, starting game one. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Take care.